Court Reporter with Stovall and Associates. We're back with Court Reporter with Stovall and Associates. Tonight, uh, James Austin, Assemblyman of District 36. Before we went to commercial, we were talking about uh, a bill that you'd said had garnered a lot of public attention and a lot of uh, communications to your office. Uh, what bill were we talking about? That was the, uh, the gun registration bill. Uh, SB 221? 221. And it was, a, um, it was a bill specifically designed, it started out as a bill that was designed to address uh, mental health and gun ownership and those kind of things. It became really a, a, a significant infringement on Second Amendment rights. Uh, that's something that my constituents specifically feel very strongly mm -hmm. about. Uh, and my phone rang constantly. I had texts. I had emails. But more importantly, uh, and, and the people who were opposed to it were, um, were very vocal and, and were the constituents that I was very concerned about. There were a few here that, that um, supported it, uh, and that's their right to support it. But overwhelmingly, the majority of my constituents weren't. But the day I think we, I referred to, referred to earlier, uh, where we got 1,500 phone calls, was from a lobbyist group that was out of New York City, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, Mayors Against Guns, I believe it was. And they had robo-dials, and, and I went in actually in between meetings to try and help staff answer some of the phone calls because we were all getting barraged with these calls. Mm -hmm. uh, but knowing that I was not going to support that bill, they barraged me pretty hard. Um, and so I started answering the phone calls, and I picked up the phone one time, and, and it, was a, it was an older lady uh, who said, um, I said, you know, Assemblyman Oscarson's office can I help you. And she goes, Mark told me to call. I said, Mark told you to call. What did he tell you to call? Mark who, ma'am? And she said, well, um, Mark Kelly. I said, Mark Kelly, the astronaut Mark Kelly. Yes, he told me to call. And I said, well, what are you calling about? She goes, I don't know. He just told me to call. And call after call after call after call, staff was answering. That's exactly what had happened. So there was a robocaller that was, um, that was addressing these, um, these particular um, issues and was uh, having people just push a button and they would call us and take up an inordinate amount of time yeah. for staff and people. And then the emails started. One time I got emails. Uh, I was out to dinner with some folks, and my, my uh, iPad started going off. And I'm telling you, 1,700 emails within um, about three hours. Oh, my gosh. Just boom, 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 boom. Completely filled up any boxes I had until it just stopped. Hmm. Uh, and then we had to start clearing them out and doing things. But no constituents of mine. These are all constituents from all around the country taking time, trying to make their voices known. But when you look and read about these things, it really had nothing to do with any of the constituency that I represent. So um, you, I was very pleased to, to not have that, uh, to not have to respond to some Obviously, of you found it distasteful. Um, or maybe I shouldn't put words in your mouth. Did you find it distasteful that this is part of um, somebody who's trying to push a political agenda forward outside of your voting constituency, outside of the state in its entirety. It was, it, not only was it distasteful, it was, I think it was unethical. I, I found it to be really something that, um, that was not representative of the people that I represent. Right. And so, I mean, it really made you, made you think about the process and how things work. And, and there were a lot of us that had conversations about how that worked in the, in the time. It detracted, it detracted staff and everybody else from being able to concentrate on, on the real issues that we were doing for several days. Right. Uh, you know, just cleaning out mailboxes and cleaning out voicemails and all those kinds of things. Uh, besides the, the level of um, uh, sometimes frustration that it created for our, uh, you know, for our constituents our, and for our staff as well. Sure. Oh, they, well, our regular constituents couldn't, couldn't get, get through. through. Right. That's a, yeah, exactly. So it was it was frustrating. But you know, um, and, and it all worked out well. While it was a partisan vote, and, and uh, uh, both sides picked their side, we uh, I chose to um, not support it. And the governor, in his infinite wisdom, recognizing I believe that it was a constitutional rights issue and a Second Amendment issue, uh, chose to veto it as well. When you guys had passage and uh, came to his desk, was it was it already known that he was going to veto the bill? He had suggested that he was going to veto it, but you never know until the signatures on the on the piece of paper. Uh, you you believe that and you you feel strongly about it. And I might say just if I may, um, very quickly, there was an alternate bill that was proposed by by the Republicans that would deal specifically with mental health that would not have any of these registration issues given a gun to your to your son or grandson any of those kind of things and it was never heard 
Um, it was simply never heard because the bill originally, despite what was said about it, was originally determined to um, to increase and take away Second Amendment rights and, and increase the ability to register guns and do those kind of things. And now I'm for that for people who don't deserve to have guns. Right. I'm just not a f I'm not for taking um, taking people's rights away. And there's got to be a specific process that's in place. And we don't we don't take people's rights away that they fought for and that our forefathers have fought for. I understand. Um, in, in the debate with the, with the gun registration back and forth, obviously it was a timing issue, uh, sensitive to um, some of the tragedies that we had gone through. Um, was there any communication with, with uh, other legislative bodies as far as what they were undergoing too in their own locales? Well, we'd get emails periodically. I'll tell you who did come up and lobby us uh, pretty significantly was, uh, and it was very interesting, is the parents of the Sandy Hook victims. They were flown in and were, um, came in and talked to us about gun registration and those kind of things and how things could have changed and affected them. Funded um, by who? Uh, by this mayor's group, by these groups that, that funded, you know, the robocalls that funded all those things. Gotcha. And they were there lobbying for this gun, this gun bill and how it was going to work. Now, the thing that I found very interesting, not intimidating, but interesting was they, uh, a lot of them were there when we actually cast a vote uh, for that bill. They're sitting, you know the way the legislature yeah. set up, you're on the floor and there's a glass area and there's the upper area that people can watch what's going on. And a lot of them were there during that period of time. So, um, an emotional time. A, sure. a lot of those bills, beca that becomes a very emotional issue when you're, when you're looking at these, these folks in the eye that have lost children for, uh, to these tragedies. Right. Um, and while we're sensitive to those kind of things, you still cannot take away people's, people's rights. That's very tough. No, it's very difficult. To Happened on several issues. Um, uh, another one was the was the uh, uh, Brianna's bill, the DNA bill, that we felt uh, I felt very strongly about, and, and I had that's another bill that I had significant conversation with constituents here that felt like there was a, a clear violation of, of their rights. Uh, DNA is the new you know the 21st century fingerprint. Absolutely. But when somebody's arrested before they're adjudicated or found guilty, to swab them and put them in the system to do things. Uh, is it clear in my mind and, and my, you know, my constituents Absolutely. and a lot of my colleagues' minds, clear violation of their Second Amendment rights. And then, even if you're found innocent, you would have to request to have that removed from the database. So the index stays regardless. Right, correct. You'd have to have it, you'd have to have it taken out. And again, clearly another, another way to, um, to have information in the system. And the argument was, well, we have, our, we have fingerprints and they're in the system. This is a little bit different situation here. <laughs> this is, DNA is a little more intimate than yeah. your fingerprints and putting <laughs> some ink on the end of your fingers. So, right. Um, right. Now, do I believe that that's a tool that could be useful? Did I have any problem if somebody was convicted of that happening? Did I have a problem I, 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 if they would have automatically taken it out of the system? The other thing is it was an unfunded mandate. Uh, I'd like to know how some of these smaller sheriff's offices, and I, and I did discuss it with, with the Nye County Sheriff's Office, how they're going to be able to fund that because it's expensive. Yeah. And currently my understanding is there's 10,000 10, cases backlogged for DNA. Oh, my gosh. We're going to take our second commercial break. We'll be right back. Court Reporter with Stovall and Associates. 